Hokuma Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Shomalikai. Freelance writer and investigator Carl Kemp joins me to unpack his book titled Why We Kill, Mob Justice and the New Vigilantism in South Africa. Mob justice and vigilante killings were and are extremely common in the country, but it is not at all certain that it is lack of state policing that is the primary motivation for such conduct. So from your research, what have you found were some of the factors motivating this? Look, uh, I have to say firstly that definitely state policing does play a major role. We can't get away from that. And it is after all also the most commonly cited factor by the communities and perpetrators who commit these acts. That being said, I do think there are some other factors that play a role based at least on the two or three case studies that I undertook. The first of those being that there definitely is a sense of uh, personal insult and uh, personal honor involved. Uh, that was the case in the in the study I looked at in Alexandra, where uh, the, the community felt that they had been disrespected. And in that case, the, the aggressors, or well, it depends on which side you ask about who is the aggressors, but from the community's point of view, the aggressors were Operation the Dula. And in their words, they said, uh, the Dula acted like they can come here and do what they want when they want. And uh, again, in that case, the, the police actually were active and they did do their job but perhaps not in the way or to the extent that the community wanted the police to act. And there definitely, from the persons I spoke to, I got the sense that A, it was about the uh, reputation. Personal insult must be met with uh, personal retaliation. You can't ask the state to do something when your reputation or your community has been personally insulted. And then secondly, and what is perhaps more important, is the aspect of compensation. Compensation was very important in that matter. The community felt that the persons who'd been harmed, okay, they went to the, to the state clinic and they were treated, but TVs were broken, windows were smashed. They felt that these things should be paid for, and that is not something that the police can organize. So that is definitely another factor. You cannot always blame police uh, because in this case study, the police were active, they were involved. Uh, I mean, you have to read the whole book to, to get the full picture, but the other factors involved is reputation and then financial compensation. So where and how do you think the police department can improve? Oh, I think there's, uh, it's such a big question, right? Um, policing is a topic for thesis you know, and, and, and policy papers that are never ending. It's, it's just so much to talk about. There's, there's theories of policing, you know. What uh, South Africa has been working with is this idea of sector policing, under the basis of community policing. So the opposite of what we had under apartheid, you know, with boots and all style policing under apartheid, where the community wasn't served. In fact, the community too often feared the police. And the police's job was not to collect evidence, it was to police and control, uh, especially people in the townships. And then when solving crimes, it wasn't about collecting evidence, it was about getting confessions. With the community policing model, um, we're looking at a, a police force that is supposed to be in touch with the community and is able to prevent crime as much as they are able to solve crime. Now, whether that has worked or not, whether that's the correct approach or not, I don't know. But that is the policing theory at the heart of our current debate on policing. From my personal view, you can put as many police units as you want on the ground. You know, and, and that's kind of been the approach from the state lately is that we need more boots on the ground. But uh, a leading criminologist uh, once stated that one police unit is not the equivalent of one unit of police service. You know, so just because you have an officer, if they aren't competent, if they aren't well trained, they don't know what they're doing, then there's really no point in having them on the streets. So the first thing for me would be for the police to look at recruitment. I think Becky Taylor at some point said that, uh, and this is now many years ago, that uh, I quote him on the book that uh, the police has become a Zamazama organization. You know, the police is a try your luck organization. People see the police uh, not as a calling, but as a form of employment. So if the police can get that right, perhaps, and start recruiting more stringently and not allowing corruption to, to break into the recruiting process, already you are going to be 100 steps ahead of where we are now. And then secondly, you know, this is a big part of the book, is that whilst we don't have an excellent police force in South Africa, they aren't perhaps as dysfunctional as we as we like to think. There's a core element of policing that is performed in South Africa. 
especially where I was in Alexandra, you know, with the station commander there, they seem to be performing. But what they can perhaps focus on doing is moving beyond the basics. And that means uh, not doing the bare minimum, which I think is perhaps uh, a bit of an attitude in the police at the moment, that uh, bare minimum on the, executing the mandate is sufficient. But that brings you back to recruitment again. You can only have more sophisticated styles of policing and approaches to policing if you have the recruits that can execute that. In the book, I, I mentioned the issues with the recent Project 10,000 recruitment drive. I go a bit into the history of uh, recruitment uh, after 94 when the police service was transformed and we lost an incredible amount of uh, experienced officers to affirmative action. The detective service especially didn't recover. So that wasn't ideal. I think recruitment is really where you start with that. And in just over five years, mob justice matters have increased from 849 to 1,894 per year. Can you tell us about the case study of the Libese and global families? Yeah, so the Libese and global families is what I cited at the start of the book, right? In 2006, that uh, that court case came to trial. The best end in global families is, is what we think of as the most stereotypical type of mob justice. When it happened, the victims were accused of uh, robbing the older Madalas in Shoshanguga area north of Pretoria. And uh, the Madalas' uh, sons went out and they found these guys that uh, seemed to match the profile of who had committed the killing and they brought them to the old man's yard. And you see, this is the question. So firstly, they didn't trust the police to find the suspect. And secondly, when they themselves found the suspect, they didn't take him to the police station. They brought him to the Mandala's yard. And again, that touches a little bit on that idea of a, it's a personal insult and it must be met with a, a personal vengeance, you know, a personal reaction. And in that case, yes, uh, you know, there's, there was differing versions of the truth at trial. But uh, what the court eventually accepted is that uh, the one victim... Uh, confessed that uh, his accomplice was this younger man, so they went to go fetch him, and so that was why they were also charged with kidnapping. Brought them back to the yard, and from there, the older men in the yard uh, started with a questioning process, and uh, as this questioning process grew more violent, persons from around in the community also started to uh, join in the questioning, and that led to beating, and you know, before you know it, the next day they found... Uh, one of the victims had managed to crawl about 50 meters from the house into a field. They found him there naked except for his underwear. And the other victim, uh, the, the, the boys who went out, again, they took him back to his grandmother's home, the younger man now. And uh, there he also died. When his grandmother and his, his, his sister and his brother were trying to take him to hospital, they say when they got to hospital, he already died in the car on the way there. So that is uh, kind of uh, what I used as the classic stereotypical example of mob justice. Now, when with reference to your statement that mob justice seems to have increased in the past half decade or so, what I kind of experienced in the book and try to explain also is that nowadays you don't really have the questioning in, anymore so much. You know, a prosecutor from Pretoria at the magistrate court told me that uh, it's, somebody shouts Vimba, it's done. You know, there's no more this uh, interrogation by the elders. There's no more giving a chance to, to explain yourself. Look, clearly you can't, uh, with, with something of this nature, with, with the phenomenon of this nature, you can't scare others or maybe self to come. You know, you can't make generalizations. There, certainly there are still cases where that does happen, where there is this kind of mini trial or a mini investigation. But from the police I spoke to and the prosecutor I spoke to, it does seem that it's becoming much quicker in the sense that people don't mess around. There's no trial, there's no interrogation, there's no truth-finding process. If somebody is accused, then there's a good chance they will be assaulted or murdered without much of a chance to prove their innocence. And uh, as you say, uh, you know, with, with if, if the rate almost doubles in five years, then of course you're going to have more incidents like that as well. And why do ordinary people participate in such extraordinary acts of violence and killing? And what does this say about people collectively and individually? Look, that's the, you know, that's the question I asked myself with this book and the whole book through all the parts dealing with the different uh, aspects uh, of the trip I went on. I, I, I really still don't have an answer, you know. It is a... Uh, 
the conventional wisdom is that well, people are so sick and tired of crime and the police are so useless that they just take matters into their own hands, you know. And uh, something else you notice lately is that, you know, even most of these incidents appear in black townships and that's where it happens. But you have also people in the white middle class who are cheering, you know, say this is good because we're all so sick of crime, whether you're black or white or rich or poor. We're all equally sick of crime. So it's good that people do this because the police don't do anything. I think that uh, we are already such a violent nation, you know, and we have been for so such a long time. And this is perhaps just the, the logical conclusion to all of that, where we're attacking criminals and we're cheering each other on while we're attacking criminals. And now, look, it's very difficult to say to someone, well, you shouldn't do that. Because the crime is a reality, right? The, the crime wave is an absolute reality. We can't get away from that. It it really, it seems that it's it's fair to say it has never been worse. You know, the last time we had a record murder rate like this with more than 27,000 murders in a calendar year was during the with what was basically a low-grade civil war between the ANC and the IFP in the early 90s and the late 80s. So it really is shocking the amount of murders we have and uh, how little control the state seems to be exercising over. And if, when you when you describe it like that, well, what else are people supposed to do? You take things into your own hands because no one else is going to come save you. But like I said in with your, to your first question, sometimes it's not about the police not doing their job. And, and, and something else we have to realize is that our crime wave is, to a very large extent, self-inflicted. You know, we, we say that mob justice and vigilantism is now the second leading cause of the factor for murders and assaults, right? But what is the first? What is number one in the rankings? Arguments, provocations, road rage, misunderstandings. That is number one on our causative factors list, right? So it's not gang-related. It's not robberies or something like that. It's us that we are doing to each other. You know, if you are at the bar on the weekend or in the shabby in the township or whatever, and somebody gives you a wrong look, that's a reason for South Africans to kill each other. So when you take that into account, yeah, and look, that's not all of the murders. There's definitely an element of predatory crime there, but a large part of it is us ourselves. But when you think about it like that, then it's perhaps not so easy to justify that we take things out into our own hands in the face of the crime way. I think that is a, you know, something that we need to look at uh, when you ask what does it say about us as a society is a lot of this crime wave is self-inflicted. And then also perhaps we can note that, uh, look, South Africans are traumatized. South Africans are traumatized by this, this violence. You know, it spills over into our personal lives, whether that becomes uh, GBV or bullying at school or something. People are desensitized and traumatized. So it's much easier to kill someone else because they stole your television when you've been living in a society where violence is so prevalent. Uh, I think it has a knock-on effect in that sense. So maybe you are extremely mad at the crime wave that's happening around you and you want to react, but you don't get the opportunity. Maybe you take that out on somebody close to you because you are constantly scared. You are constantly afraid for your children's safety and your family's safety. You can't live a normal life, especially now in the townships where things I don't think have ever been as bad in the de democratic years, you know, and uh, that maybe you, you you carry around that fear and that anxiety and that rage. And at some point it spills over and then that just creates the cycle again. You know, uh, there's a lot of criminologists out there. They speak of the country's culture of violence. And I think Anthony Altbjerger put it best is that the country seems to be at war with itself. So we have a crime wave we're facing, the external forces we're fighting, and we are fighting with ourselves also. And mob justice is, of course, then a symptom of that at its basis level. In, in addition to the police uh, not performing as we want them to, et cetera, et cetera, but that is really the nub of it, in my view. And what will such violence mean for the country's future? Look, I really can't say. Uh, it's it's obviously negative. I speak in the book about the new vigilantism. You know, vigilantism used to be fighting crime because the state doesn't do it. But what we have now with groups like the Dula and Afri Forum and Solidariteit, and everyone is doing things that the state is supposed to be doing. You have a, a strange type of new vigilantism, like this DIY attitude, both to criminal justice, but also to trying to establish law and order. Um, but I don't think it's very sustainable, right? Because the state is the, in the traditional sense of a liberal democracy, the state is the only 
group with the lawful and legitimate right to use violence to maintain law and order, when that starts splintering, um, it can make things very tough. You know, it can exacerbate some of the socioeconomic harms we have. But again, it's difficult to predict because, you know, whatever your views are about the Dula or Afri Forum or any group that is taking it upon themselves to do things, it's not ideal for somebody to have to give up their time to do that. So I'm sorry I can't give you a better answer, but uh, it seems to me that if we if we work towards a better future, but that must be attained by violence, I, I can't really think of many examples in the in in the past in history where that's led to a utopia of some sort. You know, it. Uh, but again, it's difficult to blame people who take things into their own hands because that is how bad things have gotten. And lastly, Carl, what are you hoping people take away after reading this book? Look, uh, for me, it's just important that people kind of get a bit of a, 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 a deeper perspective uh, because I think very often now people are inclined to just say, oh, yeah, you know, mob justice, the police are useless. What, what else can you expect? And again, I have to reiterate, there's a lot wrong with the police, but it's just not that simple. You know, sometimes people, uh, communities want the police to police them in, in on their own terms, you know, and not in a way that the law actually prescribes. And secondly, that they maybe think twice about uh, sympathizing or cheering mob justice killings and vigilantes, because look, it's understandable. I feel the same way a lot of the time, but uh, we have to recognize that the crime wave is is, is extremely bad. Um, we have extortion groups proliferating, kidnappings proliferating, organized crime is getting worse, but a large part of that is also self-inflicted. It's uh, people over the weekend killing each other at bars and so on. Um, you know, that is also contributing to the murder rate, you know. So crime is really bad, but we are adding it to, to it also. That was Carl Kemp speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about why we kill mob justice and the new vigilantism in South Africa.